Johnny Dollar. Oh, I beg your pardon. This is Earl Pullman's residence. Well, it better be. Who's that, Earl? Who else? Now, listen, Johnny. What's the idea I... of sneaking out of the house on me this way and at the crack of dawn? Where are you, Earl? Down here at my office. What? Well, why not? I thought you and I were going fishing this well, morning. We are. We are. Now, look, when you got down here to Sarasota, when was it, a week ago today? That's right, and you well, promised me this was one trip to Florida for nothing but fishing. Well, now, Johnny, So that's... what happened? I wasn't here more than 15 minutes before you had me involved. Well, I know, And as soon as the... I cleared it up, what happened? You turned on a few days of windy, rainy weather, and all I can do is sit look, here. Look, will you listen the to me? The one sunny day you picked to spend there in your office, my pal. Did I say I've come down here to work? What else? Well, now, you, uh, you remember that item in the Herald Tribune the other day about your being here? Yes, and the one in the evening paper and the blurb on WSPB, and I thank you for the publicity. All right. Well, what has that uh, got to do with the weather and the fishing? Well, I said, will you listen to me? Okay. And it better be good. Well, it is, and you're going to love it. Now, all that publicity you just mentioned has every fishing guide within miles make an office to take you out on the Gulf, you know, to prove to you once and for all that the fishing down here is just as good as Todd Swam and his Chamber of Commerce advertised. So? So I came down here to look over these offers and decide which one we'd take advantage of today, now that the weather's cleared. And have you? I have. Old Captain Barney B. Good. He runs a half-baked fishing camp down at Lemon Bay and is not only a good skipper, but he happens to be a client, a policyholder. Uh-huh. And he guarantees to find us snook, sea trout, blues, bonito, pompano, kings, anything you want. So if you'll hop into my car and pick me up, we'll be on our merry way. Now, you sure there isn't some teeny little unimportant insurance matter that maybe I'd better just kind of look into before we head for the briny deep? No, sir, Johnny, I swear it. I promise. Cross my heart and hope to die. Well, you coming? Okay. I'm coming. But if he tries to get me involved in another mess... The CBS Radio Network brings you Mandel Kramer and the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Tri-State Life and Casualty Insurance Company branch office in Sarasota, Florida, where I thought I had gone for a few days of fishing. But following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the Guide to Murder Matter. Expense account item one. Well, after all, as long as I was on expense account, why not be nice about it? So item one is 4.38 to fill up the gas tank on Earl Poorman's fancy air-conditioned car. Five minutes later, I walked in on him at the office. All right. Come on, Johnny. Help me up in my crutch, and we'll go fishing. I'm with you. Captain Barney Beale down there at Lemon Bay was quite a character. About 65, I'd say. Tall, lean, and wiry, and his skin tanned to the color of cordovan. His deep-set eyes were that peculiar bluish gray that made you wonder if they were looking right on through you and sharp enough to spot a seagull diving after bait a half a mile away. His boat, the Barney B, looked as well-weathered as he did, and the faded lettering across the stern showed the old craft had come from Gloucester, Mass., which helped to account for his speech. Instead of a southern drawl, it was pure New England. Yeah, born in New Hampshire, Mr. Dollar. But I learned my sea fishing down off the Cape. Cape Cod, Captain? Yes, sir. Off the George's bank and the dang Tucker shows. To bet it's the kind of instinct in a man, it does. Well, I hope that instinct's working today. Hasn't failed me yet. Not in all the seven years I've been guiding down here to this country. Now you see that long stretch up ahead with the mangrove islands on either side? Yep. Snook Alley, they call it. Now then, let's see if we can hook up one or two. One or two, we took no less than seven fighting snook out of that spot and all of them over ten pounds. Then out in the gulf there were pompano and jacks and kings and just about everything else you can think of. By mid-afternoon, I was completely and happily exhausted from hauling him in. Earl, meantime, had laid himself across a thwart and slept. So we went on back to the dock, selected a couple of nice pompano to take home, then trudged wearily over to where I'd parked Earl's car. 
That's a mighty pretty car you got there, Mr. Foreman. Yeah, well, a lot of good it's doing me these days with this busted ankle. Having to depend on Johnny here, the speed demon, to get me around. <laughs> a lot more fancy than my old Maxwell it is. Did you say Maxwell? Yep. Drove it all the way down here from New Hampshire, I did. 1922 Maxwell. And it's still running? Yep. Had it up to Venice after groceries just a week ago last Saturday. You'd like to see it? I sure would. Earl, would you mind waiting? No. Go ahead, Johnny. Right over here in the garage, Mr. Dollar. 1922, hmm? Yep. And the finest car I ever owned. Hmm. Come to think of it, the only one. Real cheap to run, too. That's why I keep it. Now then, here we are. Here now. Well, sir, there's it. My, oh, my, Mr. Dollar. Who is he? What's happened to him? The he that Captain Barney spoke of was slumped there in the front seat of the ancient Maxwell. His face against the wheel and turned in our direction. The face was gray. A mask of death. Proud we are, we being the CBS radio network, to be able to bring you on this station each weekday the songs of Bing Crosby and Rosemary Clooney. In addition to the sparkling Bing Crosby and Rosemary Clooney show, we're equally delighted to present at this same time each weekday the assorted talents of Art Linkletter, the house party man, Gary Moore and Derwood Kirby, and the rousing Arthur Godfrey time. There's no business like show business, and nowhere else such a fine sampling of same than on this blockbuster CBS Radio Network Entertainment Fest. The nicest thing about it is, should you miss any or all of these great stars on a Monday, you can catch right up with them the next day, or any weekday you're so minded. Remember, nowhere else can you enjoy, each and every weekday, the Bing Crosby, Rosemary Clooney Show, the conversational gifts of Gary Moore and his foil, Derwood Kirby, the kids' comedy and cut-ups of Art Linkletter's house party, and the air of glee with gusto that's a specialty of Arthur Godfrey time. A quick examination of the body made it pretty evident that the man, whoever he was, had died of carbon monoxide poisoning. What's more, the ignition switch of the old Maxwell was in the on position. The gasoline gauge said empty. More important, I could find no marks on the body that might have indicated a struggle of any kind. My, my, Mr. Dollar, this is a terrible thing. Terrible. Do you know who he is, Captain Barney? No, can't say I ever saw him before in my life. But he's certainly dead, isn't he? He's certainly dead. Handsome man, too. Can't be more than maybe 50, 55 years of age. Mm-hmm. Ah, look at that beautiful head of hair. Oh, Nice clothes, too, yeah. You better not touch him. Oh, don't you worry about that. When did you say you last used this car of yours, Captain? A week ago, last Saturday. Did you fill the gas tank then by any chance? Yep, fill it up the top. The see, huh? Empty now. Yes. And the garage has been locked ever since? Ever since, Mr. Dollar. Nobody else but me has a key for it. Ah, but now... Look here, sir. Don't touch anything, Captain. Oh, I won't. I won't, sir. I won't. You see here? Latch on this window is open. Let's see. Yeah. Mm hmm. See these spider webs all over it, though. So, this must be the way that he got in to, uh, to do this to himself. I, uh, I know that I should have always kept the keys and the scar. Captain, do you have any idea who the coroner is for this neck of the woods? Yep. Old Dr. Hill lives over to this side of Cape Martin. Then you better call him. Have him get over here right away. Yes, sir. Do that right away. And ask Mr. Poorman to come in and have a look. Yeah, I'm oh. right here, Johnny. Earl? That's all excitement. Look for yourself there behind the wheel of the old Maxwell. Hmm? Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> Has it been dead? Well, sir, Mr. Dollar, I'd say about a uh, day. I see. Or maybe two. Oh? Or maybe even three. Mm. So for the sake of the record, I'll say it's been uh, two days. Yes, sir. And the cause? 
Well, exactly what you said, Mr. Dollar. Carbon monoxide poisoning. No question of it, sir. That's what it is. That's what I'll put on a certificate. Any idea about who he might be, Doctor? No. And I'll tell you this, sir. There's no patient of mine would ever commit suicide this way. You're sure it's suicide? Well, well, of course it is. You don't see any marks on the body to indicate otherwise, do you? No. Well, of course you don't. But I assume you'll do an autopsy anyway, won't you? Autopsy? No, sir. No need for it. No need for it at all. No. I'll be on my way. Oh, just one minute, Doctor. Now, you just stop worrying about it, Mr. Dollar. I'll have the boys come along over here and pick him up and take him to the morgue at Cape Martin, where I keep my office, and anybody wants to claim him, all well and good. Well, just the same, sir. If I... nobody claims him, why, uh, they'll see that he gets a decent burial in the potter's field. And that'll be that. So you just stop worrying about him, huh? Okay. You're the doctor. That's right. <laughs> good day. Good day, Mr. Foreman. Captain Barnett. Bye, Doctor. Bye, Doctor. There it is, Doctor. Well, Mr. Dollar. You're absolutely sure you don't recognize him, Captain Barney, now that you've had another look at him? Absolutely certain, Mr. Dollar. Well, I know he isn't any client of ours, so uh, the doctor says, Johnny, why worry yourself about it? No point in it. Yes, yes, maybe you're right, Earl. Sure, leave it up to local police if there is anything to investigate. And you don't really think there is, I hope. <laughs> Well, come on, come on, Johnny. Let's get on back to Sarasota before you start trying to blame me for getting you involved in something. Earl, why don't you and Captain Barney load those fish into the car? Hmm? While I take just one more look at this. Instead of wasting time on further examination of the body, I went back for another look at the window that Captain Barney had pointed out where the dead man had apparently made his entry, carefully closing it after him. One of the panes was a brand new one, put in only recently. By whom? And why? There were several shards of glass from the old pane there on the floor, so I picked up one of them, cleaned it very carefully, and then by the simple expedient of moistening the corpse's hands, took a set of fingerprints. Then I joined the others at the car. Oh, at least let me pay you something for the trip today. Not a bit of it, though I thank you, Mr. Foreman. It was a pleasure and a privilege to be a guide for a famous man like Mr. Dollar. Writ up in all them papers and all, and on the radio. Well, we're certainly much obliged then, aren't we, Johnny? Of course. Next time, I'll have to make my regular charge. Don't you worry, Captain Barney. We'll be down here again. Right. Maybe very soon. That was a fine way to end a pleasant day. But I told you I'd get you some good fishing, Johnny. And if you meant that about coming down here again, I'm all for it. Of course, that means you'll have to stick around a bit longer than you may have planned, because tomorrow I thought we might take my boat out and maybe just... uh, Johnny? Hmm? You listening? Oh, of course, Earl. Um, See Captain Barney again, you said. Oh, well, that's uh, almost what I said. Look, what's bothering you anyway? You mean maybe the kind of casual way that he took the finding of that body in his own garage? Among other things. Hey, wait a minute. We better go back there again. We forgot to look and see if there was a wallet or any papers or anything to identify. No, the doctor and I both looked very carefully. There was nothing. Well, I suppose a suicide wouldn't want anybody to know who he was. That's wrong, Earl. Most suicides practically advertise their identities, and almost all of them leave a note of some kind. But if you're thinking in terms of murder, Johnny... Are you? I'm not sure yet. But you said yourself there were no marks on the body or anything like that. I know. And I'm the chode. If only that old Dr. Hill would make an autopsy after I find out who that body belongs to. Oh, now, look, Johnny, what's the point of it? And you're supposed to be down here on vacation, and you're supposed to... What? What? What's the matter? What the devil is that you have in your pocket? Oh, careful, Earl. It's a little piece of window glass I picked up on the floor of the garage. A little piece of what? Who knows? Maybe it'll give us the key to a murder. Back in Sarasota, after leaving Earl at his home on Oyster Bay, I drove into police headquarters. The man I went to see was another Barney, Lieutenant Barney Phillips. He'd been of tremendous help to me many times before, and I knew that he would be again if he could. Oh, sure, Johnny. Be glad to cooperate. All we can, all of us. 
But aren't you kind of shooting in the dark on this one? Well, maybe and maybe not. The point is that unless the police down there show a little more interest than old Dr. Hill... Look, if you can have your lab crew photograph the prints that I have on this sheet of glass... Will you? Well, then send them on to Washington? Yeah. It might take a little time, Johnny, to get a report back on them. Good. I'll spend it profitably. Fishing. It was two days later that Lieutenant Phillips called and asked me to drop in on him again. Yes, sir, your suicide had a record all right, Johnny. His name was Maury Spencer. Maury Spencer? Yes, sir, he used to operate up in New England along the coast, dealing mostly in fishing boats. I see. Haven't heard from him, or, uh, well, that means he hasn't been uh, caught in trouble, though, for a couple of years. You said dealing in fishing boats, hmm? A racket as old as the sea itself. He'd steal a boat, sneak it into a yard, repaint it, and disguise it pretty well, and pass it off on some sucker who thought he was getting a bargain. Mm hmm. Must have been pretty active, too, because, well, he sure had enough aliases. Here, you look at this. Maury Spencer, alias Spencer Morrison, alias Rusty Spangler, alias Baldy Spangler, alias... Did you say Baldy? Oh, here, I completely forgot to show you this picture of him. This man, your suicide? What? Well, well there, uh, there is some resemblance here, but um, I'm, I'm not sure. You see a little bald spot on top of his head. I'm good. Now, look, Johnny, if those prints were his, this has to be him. Of course. Plastic surgery. What? If he had the record you say he had, why not plastic surgery? Well, sure, an awful lot of crooks have done it, you know. Now, wait a minute, though. Here in the picture, this this bald spot, that body had bushy hair all over his head. Well, I never heard of plastic surgery for that. Captain Barney even went so far as to mention it himself, that nice head of hair... Okay, Lieutenant. Thanks a lot. Well, where to now, Johnny? Maybe to prove that suicide was a murder. Oh, yes, yes, sure. You can look at him again, but there's uh, not much point in it any more than there is in the autopsy you suggested. Yeah, right in here. Hope you don't mind the cold in this place. <laughs> Where's the light switch? Right here, sir. Mm -hmm. No, sir, an autopsy would be just a waste of time. Would it? Uh, which drawer, Doctor? Uh, right here. Well? Well, let's see now. Hey, hey, there's no point in you trying to pull the hair off his head. Isn't there? Well, look, Doctor... Oh, great day. This man had himself a top piece. That's right. A small toupee, just big enough to cover that little bald spot. But it's such a good one. Do you see what's under it, Doctor? Well, that's a hole. That's a wound there in the skull. Like from an ice pick or something. Or maybe from the point of a gaff. A gaff hook of the sort of big game fisherman would use. It could be. Or a fishing guide. And it wouldn't necessarily have killed him instantly, would it? In that particular spot? Well, no, sir, unless it was deeper than this seems to be. But it certainly would have rendered him unconscious. Yes. So that he could be propped up in that old car, the engine turned on, the garage closed up, and the actual death would be as you said it was, due to carbon monoxide poisoning. Why, yes, sir. Okay. How would you like to round up a couple of the boys on your police force and have them follow us? Yes, sir. Us, Mr. Don? Or Earl Purman's with me, waiting outside in the car. But follow you to where, sir? Well, I thought we might take a little run down to Lemon Bay again to see Captain Barney. <laughs> and it really was a murder. I'm afraid so, Earl. So help me, though, Johnny. I never can figure what makes you suspicious in some of these cases. Well, there are half a dozen things, Earl. Captain Barney himself, for instance. Oh, how do you mean? The old shack he lives in. Falling apart at the seams. Broken windows filled up with cardboard, and it probably hasn't been painted since he moved in. Yes. Even his old wreck of a boat, in spite of the fact he depends on it for a living, held together with bailing wire. And his car, that old Maxwell. Do you see what I'm getting at, Earl? <laughs> no, but go on. He doesn't spend a cent that he doesn't absolutely have to. 
Oh, no, I get the message. So he's not the type to be giving anything away, not even a fishing trip. Right. Unless he has a purpose. In this case, he wanted me around so there wouldn't be any suspicion of him, even when he led me to that corpse on the excuse of showing me the old car. And he's the one who brought up the subject of cars, remember? Yes, you're right, but even so, Johnny... Other I... things, too. In spite of the way that he neglects the house and the boat and the car, he was very careful to replace the broken glass in the window of the garage to seal it up. Why? To hold in the exhaust fumes after he turned on that engine. Well, that's enough for me. suppose I should have known I couldn't fool a smart young fella like you, Mr. Dollar. I don't think you really could have fooled anybody for long, Captain Barney. No, maybe not. Kind of, I guess I didn't reckon on my conscience. And oh dear, how it's been the torture in me. Yes, I kind of thought it would be. Seemed like such a smart idea having you around when I made out that I discovered his body. Such a good way to keep anybody from thinking that I could have done it. But I guess I just forgot that I would always know. Why did you kill him, Captain? Felt I had to, Mr. Dollar. When I thought of all the people he hurt, when I knowed him down east, that is, up to New England, all the fine old fishing men erupt and cheated, and then sweet talked his way out of it time after time. Then, when he come down here, as bold and brazen as he ever was, when he showed the nerve to suggest that I help him in his filthy work. Well, don't you see, Mr. Dollar, somebody had to stop him. Somebody had to keep him from hurting all the nice, fine people that I've gotten to know hereabouts. Well, I guess I done the wrong thing, didn't I? Yes, Captain Barney, I'm afraid you did. Like everybody who tries to take the law into his own hands. The police will be here in a few minutes. Shall we go out and meet him? Yeah. I guess we'd better... I don't know. Who am I to judge? But I hope they handle the old fellow as gently as possible in spite of what he did and must pay for. Expense account total? Well, this time it's only plane fare and incidentals for the trip back to Hartford. Call it 85 bucks. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. here is our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, a city held at bay by a single man with a time bomb. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar is written by Jack Johnstone, produced and directed by Bruno Zerato Jr., music supervision by Ethel Huber. Johnny Dollar is played by Mandel Kramer. Also featured in our cast were Ivor Francis as Captain Barney Beale, Ian Martin as Earl Poorman, Lawson Zerby as Dr. Hill, and Jim Bowles as the police lieutenant. Be sure to join us next week, same time, same station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, Art Hanna speaking. Complete, the most complete news in broadcasting is CBS News on the CBS radio network. At roll 59 on your Tri-Cities dial, this is WROW Music in Albany, New York. <laughs> Many merchants and businessmen of the Capital District offer you expert services and a complete line of fine products. When you shop, we hope you patronize the civic-minded stores and institutions that display the Welcome Wagon sponsor emblem. That emblem identifies the prestige firms who are playing a vital part in the life of our community through their sponsorship of Welcome Wagon service. When the Welcome Wagon hostess pays a call, her basket contains a gift from each of these progressive firms along with a warm greeting to the newcomers. In this way, the Welcome Wagon sponsors help to extend the welcome of the whole community to the family in its new home. If you have new neighbors, call State 59640 and give their name and address to Welcome Wagon. 
And if you have any question concerning Welcome Wagon service, remember that number, State 59640. It's the Welcome Wagon number. WROW Music Time, 6.35 p.m.